Hello, everybody. I'm Helena Carbon. I'm honored to be the president of Just World Educational, a small nonprofit located in Washington, D.C., in the traditional lands of the Piscataways. Today is June 15th, 2022. Our guest today on this series on the urgency of banning nukes is Dr. Ivana Nikolic Hughes, who is the incoming president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. We're delighted that she made time to come and be with us today because tomorrow she's heading for Vienna, Austria, where she'll be representing NAPF at the cluster of civil society and other gatherings being held around the first ever meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW. And she'll be at the meeting of states parties itself. The TPNW came into force only in January of last year. It's great to have you with us, Ivana. Thank you so much for having me, Helena. I'm delighted to be here. This is the fourth public conversation we've held in this series. You can see the records of the previous three, which were with Ted Postol, Ray McGovern, and Vicki Elson. If you follow the link that is prominently on the homepage of our website, www.justworldeducational.org, actually, I even printed it out. You can look at it here. Just note that the B of ban is, is in uppercase. Okay. I thought that was easier than doing screen share, to be frank. <laughs> if you follow that link, you can also learn more about the upcoming sessions in this series, which will include two great conversations with people who will also be in Vienna for the TPNW meetings. And a special session we'll hold on the scofflaw role that Israel played in becoming a major nuclear proliferator and thereby undermining the whole value of the Global Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Last weekend saw the 40th anniversary of the truly massive demonstrations held back in June 1982, in which more than a million Americans took to the streets of New York City to call for a total ban on nuclear weapons. Those demonstrations had real impact on our leaders. But after the Cold War wound down in around 1990, and the United States emerged as a unipolar global power, that mass movement of Americans calling for banning nukes tragically dissipated. At that point, leaders in the global south, like South Africa, Algeria, Costa Rica, and Bangladesh, and a handful of militarily neutral nations in Europe led by Austria and Ireland, took the lead with strong support from a civil society network called ICANN. And in 2017, those folks finished negotiating the text of the TPNW and opened it for signature. As of now, 86 states have signed on to the TPNW and 62 of them have fully ratified it. Sadly, our country is not a signatory. I see our job as being to rebuild an anti-nuclear movement that's strong enough to push our government to sign on to this very important treaty, the TPNW, and to push for the total abolition of nuclear weapons worldwide. It's always sobering to remember that if nuclear annihilation happens, it will be a much speedier and more total form of annihilation than anything that climate change can cause. The Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is one of the stalwart organizations that since its founding in that same year of 1982 has kept its eye firmly on the ball of nuclear abolition. I encourage you to visit their website, napf.org, to learn about some of their historic initiatives. It's because of NAPF's great record and also because of her own great record as a researcher, activist, teacher, and leader that I am really happy to welcome Dr. Ivana Nikolic Hughes as our guest today. Ivana is joining the NAPF after 13 years as a chemistry professor at Columbia University in New York where she has served as the director of the K equals one project Center for Nuclear Studies and will continue teaching there. She earlier won her BS in chemical engineering from Caltech and a PhD in biochemistry from Stanford. One of the key projects that even undertook at Columbia was to take a group of students to the Marshall Islands where the United States had conducted nuclear weapons testing 
from 1946 through 1958, drenching that archipelago with nuclear fallout equivalent to that from 7,000 Hiroshima bombs. She and her students and colleagues visited the islands twice to document the lengthy physiological, societal, and other long-term impacts of that testing, and to reach out to the Marshallese leaders to hear what they felt they needed to repair and make reparations for that damage. Because of her work with the Marshall Islanders and other survivors of nuclear testing, Ivana has a keen awareness of the fact that abolition of all nuclear weapons is a key issue for the peoples of the Global South in particular. Our great project director here at Just World Ed, Amel Zarub, will be leading the conversation with Ivana today, while I dip behind the scenes and do the Zoom teching. If you need anything from me, I'll be in the chat box. I hope we'll have a good time for Q&A after Amel has finished her conversation with Ivana. So Amel, over to you. Thank you, Helena. It's really such a joy and honor to speak with Ivana today. Just a few days away from the first ever meeting of states parties to the TPNW or Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which you'll be traveling to very soon. Uh, and I'd actually like to get right into that. Um, what are the issues that you hope will be tackled in Vienna next week? Yeah, hi, I'm Mel, and let me just, uh, I thank Helena and let me thank you um, as well for this opportunity. I'm so excited to be with all of you and really at this, uh, what feels like a historic moment uh, uh, just before the states parties meet for the first time to uh, make a plan for how to take this treaty, which is now in force, and how to really take it to the next level of figuring out um, how we get exactly to that world free of nuclear weapons, which is Helena um, has pointed out, uh, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has been committed to for 40 years. And so I'll just, um, I'll just mention there are a number of things that um, states um, and organizations that have been working on these issues, that have been working on the treaty, uh, have in mind for the meeting, uh, but I will uh, single out three issues that I sort of personally see as, as, as perhaps um, most important. The first issue is the issue of what's referred to, referred to as universalization. So what does it mean um, for, as Helena pointed out, 86 countries have signed, 62 countries have ratified the treaty. Um, after 50 countries ratified the treaty, that's when the treaty actually came into force. But what does it mean to have over 100 um, UN states that have yet to ratify this treaty? And what's really interesting about this point is that you have a wide variety of countries that have not signed. And so how do you approach, um, for example, countries like our own country, uh, United States, as well as other nuclear weapon states? How do you deal with the ones who actually have nuclear weapons? How do you deal with countries that host nuclear weapons? So there are uh, a number of uh, countries that, that don't actually have any in uh, their own possession, but they host uh, primarily uh, weapons from the United States. How do you deal with countries, for example, that, um, and, and I'll just name the Marshall Islands because we've already heard a little bit and I know we'll talk about them a little more, that have been affected by nuclear weapons testing, uh, but uh, uh, at, at this moment, perhaps might even still have some concerns about how the treaty would affect them. Um, so, so that's universalization. Another issue is how do you really go from where we are today, which is between, and I'll just give a kind of a brush stroke number between 10 and 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world today, depends on how you count. Um, and how do you go to that number of zero? Uh, so what does that entail in terms of cooperation, verification? Um, how does that whole process work? And then the third issue, and I'll, I'll, uh, coming back to the Marshall Islands, but um, there have been other, there are other places around the world, other countries around the world that were affected by nuclear testing. 
um, how do you deal with um, assisting victims um, as well as remediating the environment um, that uh, was affected? Um, and of course, there was uh, nuclear weapons used in 1945, but then widespread testing um, uh, around the globe, really, um, over a period of decades. So those are the three kind of, I would say, three three big big issues for the meeting. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned the Marshall Islands. Could you offer us a bit of background on American nuclear testing there, like a you know timeline and and sort of a sense of of the scale of the testing? Yeah, absolutely. So the United States, uh, as, as I assume everyone on the call knows. The United States tested one weapon in July of 1945 and then used two weapons in attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and August 9th. Um, absolutely devastating, devastating events. Um, and um, these tests, uh, these uh, attacks um, killed on the order of uh, 100,000 people in each of the, the two cities and, and literally just flattened the two cities. Um, these attacks, these bombs that were used had an energy yield of 15 kilotons. What that means, that's not the weight of a bomb. It means that you would have needed an equivalent of 15 kilotons of chemical explosives to actually get that kind of an explosion. And 15 kilotons is 15 million kilograms of chemical explosives. So you can imagine that that's a lot of chemical yeah. explosives that you would need to, to kind of cause um, an equivalent amount of energy. Um, when the, so the US, so this was summer of 1945, the very first test that took place in the Marshall Islands um, took place um, July 1, 1946, so less than a year later. The United States was ready to, to test um, uh, new weapons and continued to do so um, until 1958 for a period of 12 years. And during that time period, not only did we test bombs that were similar to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb in design, energy yield, and so on, but that energy yield kept going up. And at the same time, we were able to design a new type of bomb called hydrogen bombs, where the energy yield just skyrocketed. It was a huge jump in this energy yield. And in fact, the largest bomb that the United States ever tested was the Bravo bomb that was done on March 1, 1954. And it was tested in Bikini Atoll. Um, and it was it had the energy yield of the equivalent of a thousand Hiroshima bombs. So you can imagine this was an absolute monster. Um, this explosion um, uh, it produced a mushroom cloud that was 25 miles high. I don't I don't even know how to think of you know yeah. what it's it would scale that's yeah right. unconceivable. It's a, it's a scale that's unconceivable. That's difficult to imagine um, and appreciate. And at the same time, so this, it was, it was so big um, that, uh, you know, all of this radioactive material went into the stratosphere and then kind of got mixed in there and, and then sent essentially all around the world. Of course, the, the fallout and the kind of return of all of that radioactive material was greatest near where the testing was actually conducted. And so mm -hmm. the fallout um, not only affected Bikini Atoll, um, but it also affected um, other atolls where people were living at the time uh, with absolutely devastating consequences. So uh, I'll just say one more thing. Um, so for a period of 12 years, um, so Bravo was one of the hydrogen bombs. We tested other hydrogen bombs as well. But for a period of 12 years, it's as if the U.S. had bombed in, the Marshall Islands with 1.4 Hiroshima bombs every single day. That's what actually happened. For 12 years, 
every day 1.4 Hiroshima bombs. It was absolutely, absolutely devastating. So what are the consequences of, of that scale of, of detonation and, and you know, radioactive fallout for, for the Marshallese and, and their environment? Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, we can talk, I, I, I could talk literally for hours, but I'm going to try to sort of um, uh, kind of uh, focus my remarks on that immediate impact right when the, when the testing happened. And as I said, uh, pe people were living um, about 100 miles away is Rongelup Atoll, where a population was living at the time of the test. The fallout came down like white powder from the sky. Children thought that it was snow because, um, you know, what, could, what, what white thing could be falling out of the sky? Uh, by that evening, um, many people on Rongelup were sick. Um, they had um, burns on their hair was falling out. They had burns on their skin. They were vomiting. Um, they were feeling very, very sick. And it took about three days uh, for the U.S. to come and uh, relocate them. Um, another atoll where people were living at the time about 300 miles away is Utrecht. And something similar happened there as well. And people were moved away also three days later and then moved back to Utrecht um, actually three months later and, and, the, and people have been living there ever since. Um, and uh, Bikini and another atoll were actually both testing sites and people were moved off of those atolls in order for the testing to happen. And there was a really kind of complicated history of when they came back, <coughs> were um, sort of clean enough for them to be living there, whether they were moved again. Uh, so a really complex history. But the, the, the kind of the devastating thing is that to this day, radiation in the Marshall Islands remains. Um, and we did, as Helena pointed out, we did a series of studies to look primarily at those four atolls um, but there's no doubt, and that was just a matter of, of time and resources, but there's no doubt that other um, atolls a, a, a bit farther removed uh, were affected as well. Um, and our studies demonstrate that the radiation picture is really, really complex, um, but also at the same time, atolls like Bikini um, simply are not suitable for a population to be living there full time. Um, and um, I, I, can, I could go into a little more detail about, about what that means. Actually, I'd love it if you could. I mean, how, how does one measure the impact of, of nuclear testing? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. It's, there are really a number of different things you would want to look at. Um, and we by no means did everything that's possible to look at, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we did. One type of measurement is called, um, it, you could refer to it as external gamma radiation. Turns out the gamma radiation is um, sort of like light. We get light from the sun, uh, but gamma radiation is a type of light that has really short wavelengths and really high energies. And so it turns out it can attack our DNA, it can attack our cells. And there is gamma radiation that comes to us from other parts of the universe. Um, it's called cosmic rays. So there, there's some natural sources of, of radiation. And there's also, for example, where I'm now in New York City, there's sort of bedrock under, um, um, under Manhattan Island that has radioactive isotopes in it, which give off some gamma rays. And so, you know, walking around even a place like New York City, you're going to find that there's some um, gamma radiation and you can detect that fairly easily um, uh, with a kind of a Geiger counter type, um, type device. Um, now in the Marshall Islands, so one of the things we did was to measure that external gamma radiation in the south of the Marshall Islands. So Marshall Islands is made up of 29 coral atolls. Um, so in the south, we measured this background gamma radiation. It was fairly low. 
And then in these Northern islands, we found that the values were very different. They differed between the different atolls, but for example, in um, uh, Bikini, um, the values were up to 60 times higher than the average value in, um, in the South. So clearly this was the natural sources had nothing to do with this. This was about um, radiation coming from um, the leftover testing uh, isotopes and, and, and radioactive material, materials. Um, but that's one, that's, that's just one issue. The other issue is that you can look at um, the presence of these radioactive isotopes in, for example, soil, in sediment, and I would argue most importantly in food. Um, and food is really the one that's just a different, that, that sort of poses a different level of danger because it's one thing to kind of be externally exposed to gamma radiation. And as I said, we all at some level are already. It's another to put in food that contains a radioactive isotope that then decays inside your body, sending out gamma radiation. And then gamma radiation is in your body, attacking your cells, attacking your DNA. Very different from, from external exposure. Um, and in particular, I'm going to get up just a little scientifically. Uh, it, in particular, there are two isotopes and scary words, but, but bear with me. I'm going to get to, to some familiar words. There are two isotopes. One is called cesium-137 and one is called strontium-90. Cesium-137 is chemically similar to potassium. And I'm sure you know when you eat bananas, you get your potassium, you get plenty of potassium. Turns out potassium is really needed by our cells throughout our bodies. Um, in particular, our brain cells, when they communicate, um, they actually use potassium. And so when there is cesium-137 around, for example, in the food, and you ingest it, it goes inside your cells and it, it sort of replaces the potassium that's supposed to be there. Um, and then it's doing all of this damage. Because if it couldn't kind of get incorporated in your body, you would probably maybe somehow get rid of it and it would be out. But it, it has, it plays a role. It plays this role of replacing potassium. Strontium-90 is the second one I mentioned. And strontium-90 behaves like calcium. And that you know as well, right? You know that your bones have calcium. Um, and so strontium-90 will replace calcium, will incorporate itself in the bones. And so for instance, um, strontium-90 exposure has been shown to cause things like bone cancers, uh, cancers of the bone marrow, uh, including leukemia, so very, very, very dangerous. Um, and so these are the two isotopes um, that, for example, in the Marshall Islands, we found are still around, and they really are one of the, I would argue, one of the main reasons why um, it, um, you know, certain areas of the Marshall Islands um, should not be um, inhabited without further cleanup. Thank you. And how do you measure the, the human impact of this, of this level of radiation? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of, in terms of kind of understanding, I, 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 if I understand your question correctly, in terms of sort of understanding like what's, what's okay and what's not okay? Like how do you know what are the levels, the cutoffs? It's actually an excellent question and it's even going to be a question that um, the TPNW will need to sort of wrestle with in the coming years, because the question is, what is safe, right? And so you can, the, the, in reality, you know, the safe thing is zero radiation, right? But um, countries that have been impacted by various, um, in particular, radioactive accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima, um, countries like uh, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and Japan all have national standards and limits, for example, for presence of radiation in the food. Um, 
it's really fascinating. The US FDA also has a limit and the US FDA's limit is far higher than any of the um, national limits set by the four countries that I mentioned. Japan has the highest limit for cesium-137 at um, 100 units don't matter, I'll just say 100 becquerels per kilogram. The US FDA limit is 1,200 becquerels per kilogram, so far higher, 12 times and higher. Yeah, go ahead. Why is that? <laughs> it's a very, it's a, I would call it a very permissible um, limit. Um, and I think what we're really talking about at each of these concentrations is an increased likelihood of adverse health effects. And I think that there's an assumption at the US FDA that whatever risk this particular concentration would entail um, is, um, is acceptable. Um, but I'll, I'll also note that the, um, those national governments and, and, and um, European Union has their own limit, which is also higher than Japan. Um, those, all those numbers stand in, in contrast with the limit provided by the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, who have a limit between eight and 16 becquerels per kilogram, so far, far okay. lower. Um, and so anyhow, so, so how do you know if a place is safe? Um, it's, really, it's, it's really delicate. It's really, um, one really has to think about a variety of factors. Um, it could be that in one place, some, some of the values look good and others don't. Um, for us, for the Marshall Islands, looking at the different atolls, I would say um, we kind of came up with a very complex picture where um, some of the atolls, for example, Utrecht, we really did not find evidence of elevated um, uh, uh, radiation, which to me is overall good news. It, it I would say, add to that, that it was not such a comprehensive survey that I would just say, okay, we're done. There's no problem here. It, I, I do believe that it requires further um, work, further testing, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it's so far so good. Um, with bikini, it was just a number of things were high, including this external background gamma radiation, including um, radiation in the food. And it, it just, there's, to me, there's sort of no reasonable conclusion, but the conclusion the bikini must be cleaned. Um, and, and, and that's one of the things that, that we've really been trying to, trying to push forward. And have there been any efforts of, of environmental cleanup by the US government? Yeah, no, that's an, another really, really excellent question. There actually was a cleanup conducted in Enewetok. Um, so I've been talking mostly about Bikini, but Enewetok was another atoll where the tests were conducted. And in fact, Enewetok is where the US tested the first hydrogen bomb. And this hydrogen bomb, I described Bravo a little bit. This one was called Ivy Mike. Um, and it was actually the very first design of a hydrogen bomb. And it was equivalent. It really was very, very big. It was um, the ultimate um, energy yield was 10 megatons. So that's about 700 times uh, uh, the, the energy yield of the Hiroshima bomb. But the bomb itself was like a seven-story building. So it was a, a very different design from Bravo. It was a real, the bomb itself was a real monster. Um, and so anyway, talk is where tests were conducted. And then from 78 to 1980, the U.S. conducted a cleanup effort. And um, that cleanup effort in some sense, what I could say was successful because even so, when we went to any we talk, those southern islands um, did have very, very low levels of radiation or no radiation above background. So that was excellent news. The problem is that when you do a cleanup, when you 
actually, you know, collect all this radioactive material, you have to do something with it. And it turns out that um, the US appears to have done two things. One, which is widely known, widely accepted. They put radioactive material inside the, uh, a bomb crater and then covered it with uh, concrete and created a dome. It's called the Runed Dome. Um, it's sort of, um, I would say at this point, infamous. Um, it also kind of represents the symbol of um, really the, the danger of both nuclear weapons and climate change because the, um, the dome is under threat from rising sea levels and is therefore, you know, um, uh, really a huge, huge concern to the Marshallese. The second thing that the US appears to have done according to some documents and according to some people who were involved in the cleanup is to actually dump some of that waste in the Anahuitoc Lagoon. So while what I said is people live in the south of the atoll, um, those islands themselves might not be showing um, increased levels of radiation. There, there still is um, sort of potential for danger, both from the runidum and potentially from um, radioactive waste in the lagoon. So from that, what does accountability look like for, for nations like the US that have engaged in nuclear weapons testing? And yeah. how does the TPNW address that? Yeah, no, that's a wonderful, that's an excellent question. I'm sorry about the, the sun, the sun just came in. I hope everyone can see my face. Um, okay. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's a really great question. And we have really been trying to kind of push the US sort of, you know, unilaterally on a kind of, you know, Marshall Islands um, uh, to the to the US. And so I'll just tell you my my personal opinion of what I think should happen in that relationship. Number one, I think the US should apologize to the Marshall Islands formally. I don't just mean like send them an apology note. I mean, the president, you know, holds a ceremony in the White House, apologizes formally to the people of the Mar Marshall Islands, to their governments, and comes up with a series of steps that are both going to um, uh, make what happened right and uh, make steps to promise that something like this will never happen again. Um, and an excellent, excellent model for how this could be done would actually be Bill Clinton's apology to um, the participants and descendants of people who were uh, participants in the Tuskegee study. Um, so I, I First and foremost, I think that's 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 just you know that's step one. That's just the beginning, right? I mean, you're mean to a child in the back in the playground, and you know the first thing your parents make you do is say say sorry, right? So to me, this is just absolutely step one. Um, and then after that, yes, engaging in number one comprehensive surveys. Our work is really one of the only independent efforts to ascertain these radiological conditions, but it's not enough. We're a small group. We were able to do a, a, you know, a small number of atolls, even in those atolls, a small number of islands, um, limited measurements. The right thing to do would be to have a, a broad scale, large comprehensive survey of all the atolls in the Marshall Islands, all the different kinds of things that could be measured um, and really figure out where uh, one would need to um, do further cleanup. And then for, when it comes to cleanup, um, my view is that there should be a call for proposals. We have so much technology development in this country, so many wonderful uh, and, and committed engineers and um, uh, people working on all sorts of things. I think some of them would love to work on, you know, a way to do this safely for people involved in the cleanup. Um, I always give this example of my little Roomba uh, vacuum cleaner going around picking up um, some of my dog's hairs and, and whatever else she brings in from the park. Um, and I just, I, 
just don't accept that in the 21st century, we couldn't come up with ways of cleaning up. And, and there has been, tragically, because we've had nuclear power um, uh, plant accidents, but there has been technology development and it's just not 1978 anymore. And whatever was done in any we talk could be done better. Now, all of that is kind of, you know, uh, what do I, as an American, um, as someone who's been thinking about this issue, think the U.S. should do? What's wonderful and just super, super exciting about the TPNW is that the TPNW is going to actually have, it, it has articles six and seven that pertain specifically to victim assistance and environmental remediation. And so this is going to become, it already at some level is, we just have to get it to a point where it's taken very seriously, international law to assist victims affected by um, nuclear use and nuclear testing, and also remediate the environments that um, require it. Um, and so um, the hope is that efforts like this will happen not just in the Marshall Islands, but really in all of the places that uh, were affected by nuclear uh, weapons testing. I'll just mention Kazakhstan, where the Soviets tested uh, weapons, Republic of Kiribati, where both um, uh, the UK and the United States tested nuclear weapons, French Polynesia and Algeria, where the French tested nuclear weapons, Australia, is another place where several sites in Australia where the UK tested weapons. Um, so there, you know, there are a number of places affected. I would, I would still say none as badly as the Marshall Islands. Um, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it was in the Marshall Islands. It was even, you know, the most removed into the past, forty-six to fifty-eight. French Polynesia was was much more recently, 1966 to 1996. Um, but still, what, what happened in the Marshall Islands was really, really quite unique. Um, and so yes, uh, the TPNW is going to make it part of international law that um, these um, people and communities are assisted and that um, their environments are remediated. And as a nation that's been so affected by, by nuclear weapons testing, why is it that the Marshall Islands has uh, signed on to the TPNW? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And it's one that I haven't, I've been um, in contact with leaders there for a variety of reasons. Um, even just a, a couple of weeks um, ago, um, uh, we had the National Nuclear Commission of the Marshall Islands actually held a public hearing with our group um, where we spoke about our work and that was really a wonderful, wonderful pro productive um, discussion with a number of leaders as well as community members. Um, and I haven't discussed this with people in detail but I'll just share what my personal understanding is. So some of the language in the TPNW, the article six and seven that I referred to on victim assistance and environmental remediation some of the language there um, uh, is uh, so. There is language there to that allows affected states to um, retain agency over their own and jurisdiction over their own lands, over their own people, over what actually happens to them, and so. I think for the Marshall Islands, the question is whether that language that allows them to retain agency is the right language that makes it seem like it's their responsibility to clean up the US's mess. And so I think I don't, I, I, I by no means want to communicate that it's an unreasonable read of it. Um, I, I, I think having been affected, I think they have every right to make sure that the treaty works for them um, and, and that what is sort of expected of them um, is reasonable. Um, and at the same time, I also think that it's really, really important 
that they do retain that agency and that international treaties cannot just mandate other countries to come in and clean up something that the Marshallese don't want to, to have done. And so I think that's that's sort of where the where where I, I'm guessing the conversation is going to be going forward. And I think for all of the the parties, the states that are parties, all of the states parties, um, it's really going to be their job to convince. And as I refer to their you know sort of different categories of countries um, out there who are not signatories, not have not ratified the treaty. So to figure out how to work with each and every one country or with, with um, countries that belong to these different categories um, to make the treaty really universal and to make it work for everybody. Well, thank you so much, Ivana. I'm, I'm just so grateful to you for sharing your time and knowledge with us. And I, I do wanna make sure that there's time for anyone who's joined us tonight to ask questions. So if you're in the audience, Please put your questions in the Q and A box, um, and if there are none, then I will keep asking questions. Um, but thank you, Helena, for sharing all of those yes. links and pictures, and <laughs> a very exciting chat, as far as I can tell. Well, I thought. Uh, there, I love the pictures, even though that you had sent. So I, I did share a couple of those and I tried to share as many relevant things as possible. Um, Amel, if, if um, I could ask a couple of questions, just finish up with your questions and then I'll come in and, and anybody else who is uh, in, in the webinar, if they have questions, if they could raise their hand, that would be great. Helena, you can go ahead. I would like to share um, the, the map uh, that I think gives a, a kind of good sense um, spatially of, of you know, what we're talking about with the Marshall Islands and also get a, a better sense of um, yeah, just the, the scale of these nuclear experiments, not just by the US government, but generally in the Pacific. But yeah, Helena, if you'd like to go ahead. I think this was just a, a really good video. Oh, that is a great map. I, I love the orientation. I was like, Australia is all kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah, one yeah. side, but yeah. yeah, it's a view from somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, so that's great. And there's New Zealand, Aotearoa, nicely, uh, nicely. Um, so, yeah, my question, even though was you, you wrote an article about the CTBT the comprehensive test ban treaty um, as being something that you want the uh do you, i mean you you want us to focus on getting the united states to sign on to the comprehensive test ban treaty so um i know there's a kind of a discussion amongst people in the nuclear abolition movement as to whether partial steps are worthwhile on, on the road to you know, signing on to the TPNW or, or whether they're a diversion? Yeah, no, that's a really good question, Helena. Um, so, we, so we had been thinking about this issue of what do you do to, with the Marshall Islands? And, and, and as I said, I really do think that the first step is an apology but I personally see, so it turns out we have signed the CTBT, Bill Clinton signed the CTBT in 1996. We just never ratified it. And right, we have this problem that you need two thirds of the Senate to ratify an international treaty, which is gonna be a problem for the TPNW as well, even if we you know, um, uh, get some people to support it. Um, that ratification step is really, really tricky because, as we know, we can barely get anything passed with, you know, fifty. Well, we just have to build. We just have to build a really good movement, right? <laughs> I, I, it really this this is just going to have to be coalition building, period, right? But we just really felt with the CTBT, like. 
how do you apologize? You know, I think of an apology as something where first I say sorry, and then I explain why it's not going to happen again, you know? And to me, ratifying the CTBT would be that second step of mm -hmm. like, I really know I screwed up and I'm just, this is what I'm going to do to make sure it never happens again. So in that sense, and, and, and really just setting the TPNW aside for the moment, this treaty exists. Um, uh, other nuclear weapon states have ratified it also. Um, Russia has ratified it, you know? So when we, you know, if we wanna say we wanna work with Russia on nuclear weapons reductions, forget what's happened since the end of February for the moment. Right, but, but let's assume that you know we, we get to that place, right? You also have to say, well, and, and we have also seen through the major international treaties, um, of course, both countries are signatories to the NPT, uh, but the US uh, and have ratified it, but the US has not ratified the CTBT. On the question of whether you need any of it, right? If you have the TPNW, at some level, I'd love that to be the world we live in, right? And and I certainly I certainly hope that we can get there. Um, but it, it, you're right. The question is, you know, do you direct your energies towards these partial steps, or do you do you really pour in all of your energy in the TPNW? The one thing I have been thinking about um, when it comes to these international treaties is that with the NPT, one of the things that has made, I think, the NPT so stale at this point, um, and you know, I, that word just came into my head, but I think it works. I think it's pretty stale, is the fact that there really isn't a time component to it, right? So there's no, there's this article six and we're gonna negotiate in good faith and we're gonna get rid of the you know, nuclear weapons and then we'll have complete and total disarmament, but it's all vague. There's no timeline. There's no they promised they they promised that and in they 1968. Promised. So that you know, yeah, it's not like happened. they haven't had time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So from from my perspective, I've been thinking, you know, for TPNW, if one wanted to put a, a date, right? To me, 2045 feels like a really good date. That would be 100 years after the end of World War II, 100 years after the first tests and first use of nuclear weapons occurred. Um, I, I just feel like, and, and it's plenty of time, it's 23 more years from now, it's plenty of time to get there. And I think we should be, we should be saying 2045, no, no nuclear weapons. I think that that um, should be, but yes, in the meantime, whether you pursue or whether you sort of give up <laughs> on the US Senate for the moment and just try to get to a place where I, so I mentioned in our, in our conversation just before we started that I saw Bob Richter's In Our Hands film um, and uh, we saw it just a couple of days before the, the 40th anniversary um, and it was so inspiring and you know it, it's made me wonder about what it would take to kind of get back to those grassroots origins of the nuclear abolition movement right how do we bring it really to the masses and what was so phenomenal, I think, about the rally. And, and of course, that's depicted in the film. Um, and by the way, the film is available on Vimeo if anyone, for free, if anyone wants to watch it. But what was so fascinating to me was just the sense of unity. Um, you know, there was unity between the protesters and the police. There were, there were people of all ages, all uh, colors, all um, kind of, you know, there were people who were talking about um, being, you know, devout um, uh, Christians uh, versus, you know, atheists versus, I mean, anything and everything you can imagine. Um, they, all of America was represented. And, and I really feel like um, 
one of the, the big challenges for the movement has got to be some return um, to those grassroots origins. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to build educational right. resources to try to get there. Amel, do you have any more questions for, for Ivana? We actually have a question uh, in the Q&A from Erica Huerta Huerta. Um, who said, hello, thank you for this talk as it has been very informative. I did have one question. How, did, how has the K equals one project worked in collaboration with groups in other countries? Um, nuclear weapons working towards similar goals and what do nuclear disarmament efforts look like there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we have really been, we sort of started K1 project started. And when I say we, I'm, I'm actually moving on from that position to NAPF, but so it's a, it's a kind of a big we at this moment. Um, uh, it, the goal really was initially to sort of educate Columbia students on, on issues and then through that education to have them be able to impact um, young people perhaps throughout the country and throughout the world. And then we sort of in that process of kind of recognizing nuclear weapons are a threat, young people aren't necessarily um, engaged in the topic. We sort of then kind of stumbled upon different projects and, and that's how um, Marshall Islands became a focus of our attention. Um, it really has, um, we've really kind of tried to, um, uh, you know, build community at Columbia through, through a variety of um, sort of um, both, you know, summer programs as well as um, courses, lectures, events, and so on. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the, the next step, and I think for me at NAPF, um, will be really just that kind of cross-sectional work of trying to reach, trying to bring young people together, um, whether from different campuses around the US um, or um, from around the world. Um, there's also someone who uh, works with NAPF and, and um, his name is Christian Chiobanu, who um, has also been running a sort of um, youth initiative called Reverse the Trend. Um, and they're going to Vienna with a number of students. And in fact, when I arrive in Vienna at 12 noon, I'm gonna have to somehow make it from the airport to a youth orientation for um, NAPF and RTT at the um, Irish embassy. Uh, and, um, and so I have three hours. <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Well, that sounds well, pretty yeah, exciting. Yeah, it's gonna be yes, it's gonna be very exciting. But yes, the and and you know one of the things I would say, um, of course, the pandemic has been so challenging in so many ways and for so many and and of course most challenging for people dealing with with loss and 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 poor health of loved ones. But on the one on the other hand, it has sort of brought us together in ways that perhaps we didn't know we could you know have uh, uh prior to the pandemic um and so i've been actually in in many zoom um events where you know people were logging in from all around the globe including uh, many pacific youth um who are really really engaged in this issue because this is close to their hearts this is close to home, this is this has affected their families and their own lives, um, and they really, really care. Um, same, same with people in Japan. Um, um, there is really a, a very strong um, nuclear disarmament movement there, and of course, the sad thing is Japan has not signed or ratified the TPNW, um, and I do hope that that changes in the future. Oh, Helen, I hear me that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a kind of, I have the seed of a wacky idea, but I think it's one that might be worth, uh, worth, worth pursuing. And that is to problematize the use of the term bikini for cute little swimwear. 
So I'll tell you, I, and, and very few people know this story. Bikini, the swimsuit was um, uh, designed by a French designer in 1946. He named his design bikini after the, the bikini atoll, not because it was a beautiful Pacific island and atoll, but because he wanted his design to be explosive. He named oh, it's, it's out, I read that. It's outrageous. <laughs> it is outrageous. It is outrageous and, and it has stuck. And I have spoken to so many people who speak different languages and I have yet to find a person who doesn't tell me, oh yes, of course we use the word bikini. Every single human language appears to have the word bikini for the swimsuit in their vocabulary. Um, and it's, 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 it's devastating actually. It's such a, and you know, another cultural reference is uh, SpongeBob. So SpongeBob is, for, from, is from bikini bottom that refers to um, the lagoon of Bikini um, Atoll, uh, Bikini Island, and no one knows. Kids love SpongeBob, and they never know that we, you know, use 1.4 yeah. Hiroshima bombs every day for 12 years in the Marshall Islands. It is um, one. Uh, I, I have three children, but my my middle one is just finished um, his um, U.S. AP U.S. History course. And of course, they talked about the Cold War, but they never talked about the Marshall Islands. Um, and the fact that we don't teach this in our schools, um, the fact that we don't talk about it widely, that these are not kind of widely known facts is really, I think it's really criminal, actually. We owe those people so much. Um, and, and at least we could remember, uh, we, could, we could acknowledge and, and teach that history. So uh, we we have a question from Jean Ramsbottom. Amel, do you want to ask us this one, um, or should I? You. I, I can do it. Uh, I understand today's nuclear arsenals house 700 to 800 kiloton missiles. How many of these, if exploded by design or accident, would create a nuclear winter worldwide? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I would have to look back at that paper. There was a paper um, written in 1980 on nuclear, uh, on nuclear winter. Um, it was a science magazine article. Um, and um, this essentially came after scientists sort of figured out that the reason the dinosaurs went extinct or most dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago was that the asteroid hit the earth and essentially created unlivable conditions on, on, on the planet because there was so much soot and so much kind of debris that went into the atmosphere. It blocked the sunlight for a number of years and that stopped photosynthesis, stopped food production. And so um, anything kind of bigger than a mouse essentially or a, or a rat um, died out, just couldn't there was not enough food around. And so at that time, people realized like, oh, wait, this could also happen if you, um, you know, use enough nuclear weapons. I don't know what the exact number is, but, um, you know, to me, there's a number at which civil, whether or not we actually reach that point of nuclear winter, um, you know, if you had 10 of those 800 kiloton bombs, you know, in every which direction, I, I, I think civilization as we know it is 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 not going to recover. Um, I think it would take a very, very, very long time for civilization as we know it to recover. And if we really did get to a level where it's nuclear winter, then forget it. We're we're. I mean. It's just, it's, 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 that's it for the human um, species. Um, and as Helena said, you know, it's a, in science, there's something called phase transition, right? So we all know like 
water can be liquid, right? And that's very different than when it's in, it, it's in solid form as ice. And it's very different than when it's in gaseous form, right? Where we sort of can't really see it, but we know it's there. Um, to me, nuclear weapons are like, the use of nuclear weapons would lead to a phase transition in, in human civilization. It would just be a completely qualitatively different world. Um, and, and that's a little different from climate change where we sort of have this gradual change. And, and yes, we could reach a point where the so much change has accumulated that we, we do reach that phase transition. So I'm by no means trying to, to um, minimize the problem. It is an enormous problem. But nothing threatens us, as, as Helena put it, so fundamentally and so like in a second, right? The, the climate change impacts are not going to happen in a matter of minutes. Um, they could be very bad in a matter of minutes someplace where you know wildfires happen or some huge storm comes in, but that's still going to be a local impact. This is going to be um, if there are nuclear exchanges, if it's an ongoing um, nuclear thing, it's going to affect the, the entire world, um, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think in, uh, in connection with that, and you're um, describing it as a phase change, I think one of the kind of rhetorical devices that's been used in this country to kind of... Uh, sand away at the edges of that concept is, is the use of the term weapons of mass destruction as though, you know, chemical weapons, nu nuclear weapons, biological weapons, cyber, they're all kind of the same. Right. But actually, uh, you know, chemical weapons are horrible. Right. I mean, you know, I, I have friends who are survivors of, of Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons attacks in, in northern Iraq. You know, I, I don't minimize it for a moment, but still, it's as you kind as you said, it's sort of localized. It's not the whole of civilization as we know it. Yeah. Um, and and so you know all this uh, concern that there's been in the U.S. Um, regarding Iraq or other countries, you know, oh, they're getting weapons of mass destruction. Right. But hey, let's look at actual nuclear weapons. Let's look at the nuclear arsenals that exist. Yeah. And, and I'll just add Helena to that, that to me, the US really bears the most responsibility. We do have a, a similar number to the number of, of weapons that Russia has, and that's fine. We are still the ones that developed them first, that tested them first, and that has most, used them. Most importantly, that actually use them on civilian populations, on cities where you know, this was this was a war crime. This was not, you know, this was not, you know, uh, uh, in 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 uh, alliance with the Geneva Conventions. This was not about protecting civilians. There was nothing about protecting civilians when you were willing to unleash these deadly weapons on on people of a city. Uh, 100,000 people in Hiroshima, about the same number in Nagasaki. It's just absolutely devastating. So I really do think that we bear a special responsibility and that we should, in some sense, be leading these efforts um, to get rid of nuclear weapons, not, you know, standing in, in the background and wondering when, when the activists were going to go away, right? We, and, and I think we all should be demanding this of our own government. We should be pushing this issue. It really is, um, and, and, and again, you know, just to bring in the, the Ukraine war for a moment, um, I, I think some of us who are aware of the dangers, I mean, I think I was like just frozen for for days when the war first began, um, just you know, terrified of, of where this is going to go, um, given the fact that nuclear weapons, in fact, are in play and in fact are, you know, on submarines and in silos and deployed and all kinds of things are, are out there. And it's very, very dangerous. So um, Amel, do you have any more questions for? 
Ivana. Well, I know that you've just returned from French Polynesia and that I'd really like it if you could take a moment to kind of, you know, tell us how, how did American and French nuclear testing in the Pacific, you know, differ, compare? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so first and foremost, um, you know, the, the time periods don't even overlap. So um, Marshall Islands testing was 46 to 58. Uh, the French started testing in Algeria in 1962, if I'm not incorrect, and then 60, by 66, they moved to French Polynesia and it lasted 30 years. Uh, based on just the number of tests, Marshall Islands had 67 tests and French Polynesia had 193 tests. Um, in the Marshall Islands, all of the tests were atmospheric. In French Polynesia, the, um, uh, the, uh, only 46 tests were atmospheric and the rest were um, underground. Um, it, France was actually the country of the five uh, nuclear weapon states, so the ones recognized by the NPT, so US, Russia, um, China, United Kingdom, and France. France is the only one that kept testing in the atmosphere after 1963. So um, 1963 was the atmospheric test ban treaty, so the US stopped, Russia stopped. The UK stopped. Uh, the French kept testing in the atmosphere until 1974. Um, the French in French Polynesia, um, so French Polynesia consists of hundreds of islands, um, and they did um, test weapons in two atolls, which to my understanding were not populated immediately prior to the testing nor does it appear that they were ever populated um, before. And yes, there was fallout from, from French nuclear tests that reached populated islands, but it was nothing like what happened with Bravo. It was nothing like visible fallout falling you know, on, on, on people on an island. Um, the, the, the total energy yield for France was, um, I want to say about 10% of the total energy yield for, of the Marshall Islands. So even though they did test some hydrogen bombs, they simply were um, uh, far less powerful. Um, so there's some, you know, there's kind of pluses and minuses, you know, the, the French clearly tested, you know, I mean, they stopped testing um, just, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, um, and so they certainly kept testing uh, far, you know, far, far, far too long. Um, but they did make some decisions that I think were um, a little better. Now the U.S. always says we didn't know, and we didn't know, and we didn't know. But you know, that's um, kind of easier to say. Um, um, and and there is even with something like Bravo, there's some historical evidence that really they actually did know that people would would be in harm's way. And and Gosh. in the case of oh, yeah, uh, uh, can I go ahead? Yeah, just quickly though, because we okay. I, I just saw the time. We need to start yeah. wrapping up soon. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 um, with both like French and American nuclear testing, uh, did communities need to be relocated and, and have they been able to return? Yeah, so my, so for France, for, for Polynesia, no, nobody was relocated. People kept living where they were living. Um, Gambier Atoll, where we had a group um, uh, go just a couple of weeks ago, um, that, um, that island, Gambier group of islands, uh, they actually had a cluster of thyroid cancers. Now, I was talking earlier about some different radioactive isotopes. There's one radioactive isotope that's really critical at the time, like right when the test is happening, and it's called iodine-131. It accumulates in, in, in the throat, in the thyroid, um, and causes thyroid cancer, but that radioactive isotope 
doesn't last in the environment very long. It might be around for weeks, you know, or 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 even just a few months, but then it's gone. So you know, 30 years later, you don't worry about iodine 131 at all. It's completely, you know, it's completely gone. Um, but at the time of the exposure, and now these cancers don't show up, you know, the next day, they take a while, but there has been a well-documented um, cluster of um, thyroid cancers in Gambia. So what a fascinating conversation. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to break it off here because I just saw the time a little earlier. And I really, my deep thanks to both Ivana and to Amel because uh, Clearly, the two of you and I could go on talking for a long time about this. I am learning so much from you, Ivana. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you both so much for having me. This has been really fun. So um, just before we close down, I got a couple of quick housekeeping notes. First, I'd like everybody to remember that Just World Educational is completely reliant on grassroots support to keep our cutting edge programming going. We recently did a great project on Ukraine. Um, and you, if you go to our website, www.justworldeducational.org, you'll find out about that. Um, if you haven't donated to us recently, please go to the donate button on our website where you can learn how to give securely, whether online or with a check through the mail. Second, please know that on Saturday, this Saturday at noon Eastern time, our guest will be Joseph Gerson. He's the executive director of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security, which is based in Boston. And he's vice president of the International Peace Bureau. Joseph is an, a veteran anti-nuclear organizer and writer and has just been at a key meeting in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia on the continuing campaign to build nuclear weapons free zones around the world, which is kind of a complementary, or perhaps you can say it's a constitutive part of the idea of building a nuclear weapons free world. Um, anyway, Mongolia is a key leader in that movement. Thirdly, please know that all the records of the conversations in this series are being made available in as timely a fashion as possible. And we can we hope you can share them with your friends and networks, especially next week when you know the TPNW should be, I hope, top of the news um, in all the main corporate media. And if it isn't, please write a letter to the editor and tell the editor that you want to learn about the TPNW. Anyway, for the moment, we're, we're sharing um, the records of these conversations via this page, this page, um, and we are also starting to build them into a new online learning hub on our website, which will join the collection of other great online learning hubs that we have there. Um, fourth, uh, did I mention that all this work takes resources and we'd love it if you could support us? Yeah, I think I did mention that, so that's not fourth. Anyway, it's really um, a sad moment to have to say goodbye to Ivana because this has, you know, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you, Ivana, since we started planning this. And we send you off with all our love and, and best wishes for your safety as you travel and to have a really rewarding and, and productive time at the meeting of states parties of the TPNW. We can't wait to hear your reporting when you come back. Or maybe you could put some stuff on Twitter and we'll follow you on Twitter. And so thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Amel. It's great to be working with you on this project. And everybody thank you else. Thank so much. Thank you both so much for having me. And I had a great time and have really loved get, uh, getting to know both of you. So thanks again. OK, so everybody join us on Saturday if you can. Thank you, everybody. And I'm going to close this out if I can just figure out how to do it. <laughs>